Well, let's imagine that life is one day. That morning sunshine will not come back. And here we are right after lunch. It's about your movie. And it's after intermission. How would you like your movie to end? You are in a director's chair. Here is your movie. You're the director, the producer of your movie. And, oh, it's okay. <laughs> ah. I never had that. Wow. Thank you very much. I am so delighted that we can hopefully have a meaningful conversation because I too have a dream. I too have a dream that we can unite rather than separate, that we can enhance each other with our differences. I price the difference that I can be I and you can be you, but together we're going to be much stronger than me alone and you alone. Yeah, I do have a story, but I'm not my story. Because I go through the valley of the shadow of death. I don't camp there or set up house all there. I will never forget what happened to me, especially when I was coming yesterday and saw this brilliant architecture. I may not overcome it. I came to terms with it. And I'm very, very grateful to really give birth to this wonderful organization that you're going to grow and grow and grow. And what is more wonderful for me that I can be here and touch you and hug you and, and see how we can really give birth to the you that was meant to be, to be free. And when we talk about freedom, we talk about the ultimate freedom to really not to recover, but to discover the you that was meant to be. The true you. Because you know when we are born, and I did a lot of research in my time, and when I take a baby to a grocery store that is covered with a blue blanket, and then the same baby covered with a pink blanket, that little girl is going to get much more touching. We pick them up much more often. In my days, not in your days anymore, if you became a doctor, they probably told you because you couldn't find a husband. They also told the little boy to become a somebody, but they told the little girl to find somebody. So I'm here to really tell you how wonderful it is to be a whole person, W-H-O-L-E. And the best thing you can do as parents to teach your children how to be good parents to themselves. Because the more you depend on somebody to come to you, the more you depend on putting your life into someone else's hand, you're going to have a life of a victim. So we can really talk to today about the difference between a victim and a survivor. I was victimized. I started to work with couples, and I went to my supervisor. And uh, I'm a former dancer, so I love to do my choreography, how opposites attract. They drive each other nuts in marriage. They try to change each other. So my supervisor said, uh, so how is it, Edie? And I said, well, they're talking to me about sex, money, and in-laws. Maybe not in that order. 
said, so what's your problem? I said, I'll tell you what. I met my husband when I was 17. I was a mother when I was 19. I have three children now. I'm married 20 odd years, and I know nothing about sex. So he said, well, you're so ambitious. You come the first one here, the last one to leave, and, and so I'm going to send you to Master St. Johnson. So I became a diplomat in sexology. And one thing I can tell you, that in America, three girls and seven boys are molested. And if you have been sexually abused, you may be far more in prison than I was in Auschwitz because I knew who was the enemy. I was told every day very clearly that I'm never going to get out of here alive. So I'm going to be very quick because I really want to, to talk to you uh, and find out about you. But I did a couple of TED Talks, and one of them, they gave me a word called impact. And I don't use that word very well. And this is what I told them. The biggest impact on me was my mom. My, because my mom in the kettle car hugged me. And she said, we don't know where we're going. We don't know what's going to happen. Just remember, no one can take away from you what you put here in your own mind. And this is what I tell children when I speak at schools, how, how wonderful it is when they stay in school. Because in America, the more pieces of paper you pick up, the freer you become. So I'm here to really hopefully educate you about not where I've been and what I've done. It's what I have discovered. What I have discovered and what I did discover, that my mom was right. Everything was taken away from me. So imagine if you go home now and you find your place totally empty and everything is taken away from you, even your iPhone. <laughs> huh? That's exactly what happened. And when I arrived in Auschwitz in May 1944, it's documented at the at, um, Red Cross. So that's why I know. At the end of the line was a man called Dr. Mengele. My sister Clara, who was a child prodigy, accepted at the music conservatory in Budapest. She was already in a camp, and her Christian professor smuggled her out and hit her until the end of the war. And those are my heroes. If you like to read the book by Corrie Tim Boone, she's my hero, The Hiding Place. A beautiful woman whose sister died in her arms. And so, so I'm going to take you a little bit to Auschwitz, and then I go in and out and in and out. You know, I'm a, like James Joyce's stream of consciousness. I take you the there and then and the here and now. Um, I followed my mom. Dr. Mengele pointed my mom to go that way. And here comes, you know, Camus' absurdity. The very man who annihilated my family came after me looked me in the eye, grabbed me, and said, I'll never forget the eye contact. He said, you're going to see your mother very soon. She's just going to take a shower and promptly threw me on the other side, which went live. You know, sometimes we don't appreciate what we have, you know, until we lose it. So we were taken to a place called Birkenau. My sister Magda, my older sister, who is alive and well, she lives in Baltimore, and sometimes she plays bridge with Omar Sharif and tells me he's not so handsome anymore. <laughs> uh, she's a life master in bridge, and she teaches piano, and uh, she was with me. She was with me in Auschwitz. So we arrived in Birkenau, and I asked one of the inmates, 
when will I see my mother? She pointed at the chimney and she said, you're going to see your mother soon. I said, well, uh, that's what I was told. She pointed the chimney, the fire coming out of the chimney very coldly. She said, your mother is burning there. She pulled out my earring. I was bleeding. I was going to give it to you. This is what we call in psychology the displaced aggression. Because she was there much longer than I am part of the final solution of Eichmann. I was one of the last transports coming. Is it good? Working. Shall I hold on to it? No? Okay. Now, the question I ask, how do you find from within when nothing comes from without? Dependency breeds depression. That's what I discovered. They set us down in, in, a, in a place and all of a sudden we were shaped completely. My sister Magda was a pretty one in my family, the sexy one. I told you yesterday, my mom said, I'm glad you have um, brains because you have no looks. And I became a very erudite teenager. And uh, yes, I, and didn't hurt me any because I graduated with honors at the university in Texas. So um, everything happens for her greater good. I'm totally convinced of that. So Magda came to me with her locks and asked me a question, how do I look? Hungarian women are pretty vain, you know. Now, I had a choice then, as you have a choice now, whether you will pay attention to what you lost or see what is still here. Thank God I didn't psych study psychology then because I became Magda's mirror. And instead of telling her that she looked like a little naked dog at best, I said to her, Magda, you have beautiful eyes. And you know, I didn't see it when you had your hair all over the place. So I think, you know, this is your time out here to see in which way you can concentrate on what is. And what is, is you and I right here, right now, that hopefully that you're going to really open up here because we are among sisters and brothers. And I came to America and I never told anyone I was in Auschwitz at least 20 years. You asked me who I was, I would say, who do you want me to be? I became a very successful schizophrenic because I wanted to be a Yankee Doodle Dandy, you know. I wanted to lose my Hungarian accent. I spent three years at the university trying to get rid of the accent, and a beautiful professor said to me, you know, Edie, I'm beginning to speak with a Hungarian accent. Why don't you get the hell out of here? Your English is fine. So just in a nutshell to tell you that um, Auschwitz was a place like anything in life was an opportunity. An opportunity for an opportunity. And this is what I like to share with you, the kind of things that I discovered. Not recovering, but discovering. And one thing I rather we knew, that if you only concentrate on the me, 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 you didn't make it. We had to rise above that and commit ourselves to each other because all we had was each other then. And guess what? All we have is each other now. Is that a moment where you want people to ask you a question? Exactly. I have to add Please. that Edie is still... Um, 
practicing as a psychologist, uh, say psychotherapist uh, in San Diego, very successfully, um, right? Mm -hmm. and, right, uh, right. Um, so if anybody would like to start the, the dialogue with Dr. Edi, there's a running mic, please raise your hand. Please. Um, Dr. Lady, yesterday you said um, afterwards you discovered that uh, the state you were in in Auschwitz was a state of meditation. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so I'm talking to you about the things that I discovered, and I discovered how to talk to myself how to really engage in an internal dialogue. And what I had, uh, I had a boyfriend. I had a beautiful boyfriend, and we had plans together. And when I was already in a cattle car, and he somehow saw me, he said to me, um, we'll never forget your eyes and your hands. And I said to myself, if I survive today, then tomorrow I'm going to be free. Tomorrow I'm going to be free. And so that kept me going. What really kept me going was my curiosity. I differentiate between a childish part of us and a childlike part of us. I just wanted to know what's going to happen next. I asked myself questions like, does anyone know I'm here? I felt so thrown out. But what I have discovered that I couldn't change what was outside of me because they could throw me in a gas chamber. They tortured me. They beat me, especially in the morning when we held on to each other. And, and they told us, if you're not feeling well, you can stay behind. You're going to go to the, uh, to the hospital. But there was no hospital. There was only a gas chamber. So we had to learn very quickly what is the situation there. But I remember that when we took a shower, we didn't know whether gas is going to come out or water is going to come out. That's why you see there is a difference between stress and distress. I've been working with PTSD for many, many years, close to 40 years. And uh, I hear that from Vietnam veterans. If I would have been here over there, my body wouldn't have died. And I, too, had survivor's guilt. And I, too, had survivor's shame. So, you see, we never knew what was going to happen next. So can, you, can you share um, with us um, one strength? One thing. One strength, yes. One strength. To let go of what I was not in control of. Thank you. I would like to open that up. Somebody having a continue the debate, please. Mike is coming. Dr. Edith, I'm very happy to, to have the chance to meet you today. And this uh, conference or this meeting is called Commit to Healing. And if I see you there with this age, with this power, uh, with the experience you have made in your life, I want to ask you, what is your secret? I go swing dancing every Sunday. <laughs> I am a, I'm concentrating on the quality of life, and therefore I learn from everyone the most obnoxious person is my best teacher. My patients are my teachers. Shall I give you one, one example of a patient? Do you want to hear? You want to hear? Okay. It's a very interesting young man who came to me, and he told me he's a boot boy. And I didn't know what it meant. He wore a dark brown boots and a brown shirt. I didn't know what that meant until 
He took his elbow and put it on my desk, and this is what he said. Hey, Doc, it's time for America to be white again. And I'm going to kill all the Jews, all the niggers, excuse me for quoting him, all the Mexicans and all the chinkos. Now I'm going to tell you the difference between reacting or reflecting and responding and compassionately listening. If I would have reacted, chances are, I would have said, hey, you, who do you think you're talking to? I saw my mother going to the gas chamber. But I think people are sent to me, so I'm talking to God, as I did in Auschwitz. And I say, hey, God, what's the meaning in this? And God said to me, find the bigot in you. So I'm I'm fighting with God because I said it's impossible. I came to America penniless. I didn't speak a word of English. I worked in a factory in 1949. I always went to the colored bathroom. I joined the NAACP. I marched with Martin Luther King. I'm on and on. God said, find the bigot in you. And then I looked at that 14-year-old boy thinking that he has gotten in a place where some charismatic leader now told him that he's a somebody because now he can kick into someone even though he's on the bottom of the totem pole. And all of a sudden, my hatred turned into pity. And I realized that it's my job to create an atmosphere and a climate so he can feel any feelings here without the fear of being judged. And I looked over. I pay a lot of attention to eye contact because I can kill you with my eyes. And I can love you with my eyes. Take your temperature several times a day. See if you want to feel soft and warm or cold and still. By the way, When I'm angry at you, you don't suffer. I do. I'm very selective who's going to get my anger at my age. Yeah. Um, I looked at that young boy, and I provided that place for him, and I said three words. Tell me more. It's called compassionate listening. Thank you. And this this uh, this is not easy to do. But he certainly taught me a lot. And I hope that uh, you are in the healing part is going to do that because healing is very different from curing. I spoke one year to 800 oncologists about the difference between curing and healing. So they do the curing, but healing is an inside job. I'm going end of the month to a cancer clinic in Texas, referring to cancer as a gift of God, because it gives an opportunity for an opportunity to everyone, whether they're going to really do the healing work within themselves and recognizing that maybe women have problems being assertive, dealing with anger. Women are too good to be true. And that's why women die of cancer and men die of heart attacks. So I'm going to go there and see what we can do with the healing. Thank you, Um, Dr. Eddy. um, Is anybody wanting to comment on this? I had a next next question when there... It's actually related to this. Yeah, I had the pleasure of seeing you interact with people yesterday, and several people came up to you and talked about their concerns. And you're talking about how you've interacted with people, and it's incredibly moving. And I think we all wish we had your resources, but we don't. 
However, there are times when each of us has people come up to us in a professional context, personally, who are saying, the worst thing in life has happened to me. And the tendency is, particularly after hearing you, to think, you have no idea. But maybe that is, doesn't work. So could we have some coaching as mere mortals about how to deal with people who believe that their crises are the worst when you know they're a lesson? If we had some time, I would love to do some role playing. I'm very good at role playing. Uh, we may not have the time uh, here, but maybe in the break. We don't have the time. But this is what I tell you. There are no crises. There are only transitions. There are no problems. There are only challenges. The more affluent a country is, the more crises they have. If I go to Hungary and ask a woman about midlife crisis, she, she thinks that I lost it. You know, we don't have time. We don't have time for that. So I think it's very important to look at everything as a transition, like midlife crisis. I can't have any babies, but who wants them anyway by then? You know, there is a wonderful postmenopausal zest, and women can be alive and very, very, very sensuous and beautiful. And, and so it's uh, not putting ourselves in a box and categorize and compartmentalize. You know, it's, 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 you have the choice, and the more choices we have, the less we feel like a victim. Again, it's not who I am, it's what was done to you. And that is very important, especially when you were sexually abused. You're not, uh, you know, used merchandise or anything like that. And I think I worked very, very hard on that, that I'm not better than anyone else or less than anyone else. I am me, and when I am lying on my deathbed, I know I'm going to be very satisfied that I came here, and I came back to Germany, and I'm here now, and I'm alive, and um, nothing really is more beautiful than, thank you, than, uh, than enjoying every moment in life. I, I don't ask you to not have the emotions Emotion is good. It's energy. Emotion is energy in motion. That's what, of course, it is. Uh, it's all about energy we're talking about. But I don't let things get to me, even though in, uh, that's what I learned in Auschwitz. I could not really control anything, but I came to the realization when I was 16 years old my mother was right. I had a good, good brain. And I looked at the guards and I said to myself, there is no difference between you and I, because if I would have been born in Vienna, I would have been very happy, probably. Love Uncle Hitler, who was going to tell me that heute Deutschland und morgen die ganze Welt, and I would have been very impressed, right? Well, <clears throat> so we're okay. not born to hate. We're I think, not born to hate. I, I really think this is such a, I, you know, to me, this is a big moment here, so. Help me, <laughs> guys. Right. Um, thank you. But I think there's a beautiful... Jean-Guy will have a question. Thank you. Yesterday you told us that you are a great-grandmother four times. I am three times. I'm a three great times. grandma, and that, that's my best revenge to Hitler. Yeah. Yes. I have, four, <laughs> I, I have four generations. Rock on. There you, go. <laughs> you have spoken beautifully about curiosity. Discovering, not yes. recovering. Yes. And with your appetite. I for... have yet to arrive. I'm still in a process of becoming. And, and with your appetite. How can you share with your great-grandchildren or with the teenagers of the world right now who are living in what seems to be a, a state of depression or apathy? How can we revive the appetite for life in them when we feel they have a world of opportunities and so much already? Children don't do what we say, honey. They do what they see. Be sure that you never raise your voice in a family. Be sure that you have a dialogue with your children rather than asking questions. How was school? And um, be careful. Be careful the way you talk. And the best thing for children is a happy marriage. 
So I like two whole people getting together rather than two halves trying to make a whole. I am very big on that, very big on that, and talk to the children. Of course, it has to be age appropriate. So because the, the, the children's brain is not developed. Our reasoning ability is not developed. That's the last one we have. And when you start arguing, that reasoning ability leaves you, and all you do is just bark at each other. I don't know what would I have been without Auschwitz. If And I have been educated and studying human behavior for at least 60 years. But I tell you, Auschwitz probably was a place where I got the best education. And there is a difference, you know, between the IQ and the EQ. And that emotional IQ is something I think parents do not allow children experience any discomfort. And I feel sorry for children who are spoiled because they were the first one to die in Auschwitz. They gave up. So please don't do for a child what they need to do for themselves so they can become comfortable with discomfort. So that's why I don't call me a shrink, call me stretch, you know. And this is, this is what... Uh, uh, what um, Viktor Frankl and I talked about, I became a diplomat in logotherapy. I met Viktor Frankl, and I, um, when I read Man's Search for Meaning, I wrote a letter, Viktor Frankl and me, and he wrote me from Vienna, and I was fortunate enough to do the keynote address for his 90th birthday. And we, we used the same method, how to disassociate, because... He told me, uh, when I told him that when I danced for Dr. Mangala, I closed my eyes and I pretended that the music was Tchaikovsky and I was dancing the Romeo and Juliet at the Budapest Opera House. And he said, well, I, when I was tortured, I too closed my eyes and I said to myself, I am going to lecture in Vienna about the psychology of the concentration camp. He was 20-some years older than I was. So you see, uh, but we use the same. So when I work with people who have been sexually abused, they check out, and they're still checking out because they keep their secret. And what I know about secret, you keep secret what you're ashamed of. And I had tremendous survivor's guilt. I graduated with honors. I never showed up for my graduation. I said to myself, I'm too, too old. I should have done that 20 years ago. See, I didn't need a Nazi. I had one in me. I not only had survivor's guilt, I had survivor's shame. And shame is awful. If, you, if I talk to people with any kind of addiction, I'm looking for shame as a bottom line. Yes. Does anyone want to comment on this or take this any further? Catherine? Uh, we have a running mic here. Oh, we have two questions. Okay. Do you ever have nightmares or have you seen your mind? She's asking about nightmares. Nightmares, yes. Yes, and I do have PTSD. The other day I went to Costco and... Uh, and uh, I have a woman who lives with me, and she babysits with dogs, and she told me to park in the back. So I go to the back, and I realize that there's a barbed wire there. Immediately, I was back in Auschwitz. But then the realization that I'm at Costco, and I do have a blue American passport in my pocket. Believe me, every little thing... Uh, can remind me of things, and I'm okay with it. It's fleeting. I did go back to Auschwitz. I worked with two Vietnam veterans, uh, both paraplegics, and uh, and realized that I didn't do my homework. 
I felt like an imposter with a white coat Dr. Eager Department of Psychiatry. And I decided to go back to Auschwitz. And that was the most positive thing I ever done. However, I called up my sister Magda and I said, we lost our family and we never went to a funeral. See, Jewish people celebrate life rather than mourning the dead. And I needed to go back, probably the biggest cemetery, and tell my mom that she was right. This is exactly what happened. Came to America, and you know, my name is Dr. Eager today. And my sister said to me, you're an idiot. <laughs> I've never seen such stupidity in my life. You know, what's the matter with you? You're a masochist or something? So we experienced the same thing, two entirely different responses. Thank you. There's one more question. One more question. I, um, my name is Catherine, and I, I, I don't have a question as much as I wanted to say to you the uh, just the enormous. Can you speak in your mic? The, the power of your your honesty and your authenticity is so moving. Uh, it's uh, it's so beautifully powerful. I wanted to thank you for it. Thank you for what you've devoted your life to and who you've become and for being a model for all of us to strive to be so authentic and so uh, gentle and so intelligent and so understated. And uh, I've learned more in these 30 minutes than in 30 years, I feel. Oh, my God. But I'm serious. Oh, Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you so much, Kat. I think Catherine spoke for many of us uh, just now, and uh, thank you, Catherine. Um, we, do we have more time? So anybody else wants to please ask any question or say anything? Hi, my name is Norbert Intermeyer. Um, I was very impressed because when you talked uh, about your story, I always think about, uh, I was thinking about Viktor Frankl and you, uh, it, it's funny that you t uh, talked about him now. Uh, he had almost the same story like you had, I guess. And he said afterwards, he, uh, you, you just have the chance to die or to decide to, to live afterwards, after this experience in life. But uh, what I want to ask is, uh, if you survive that, um, what, what do you really think what our society needs now, because we live in, in, in a society which a lot of conflicts, as you see, uh, religious conflicts, political conflicts, every day if you uh, uh, switch up the news, they're really horror news. So what could be the part or um, the possibilities of the industry we are working in uh, to participate, uh, to heal this conflict somehow? Or what do you think are the most important topics for you? Uh, I hope I'm quite yeah, clear I what think, I mean. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, what is most important? Well, I think yeah. how I understood Norbert is what is most important. To, for us right now, right, to understand from your yes. experience in our society right now, what can we use for the part of the healing process as, as a tool? Write down a few things that you want to practice every day because whatever we practice, we become better at it. And one number one would be I am powerful. I am powerful. That means I have the power, the way I will respond to anything, rather than 
react and shoot from the hip and use the cowboy mentality. If I don't like my neighbor, I shoot them. Um, no, no. To be able to regain, see what happens. I'm going to talk to you as a shrink. What I am realizing with my patients, I'm a very sophisticated clinician, you know, and I worked with a psychiatrist for 20 years, who was the chief psychiatrist you know, for the army. I did all the work and he wrote the prescriptions, you know. So, what is important for you to regain your power? That I am powerful. The word understand is very academic. It's all up here. Don't try to understand something. See in what way you can hook up to anyone with feelings. Now, in the English language, I do a lot of lecturing on bullying. Uh, one of the things I know that I tell young people, when somebody tells you in English, you, you're going to be dumped on. You know, you give me a headache, and if you would change, everything would be fine. If you would just cut your hair or bring home a good report card, you're going to be dumped on. And you say to yourself, the more they talk, the more relaxed I become. And that's what I learned in Auschwitz. Because I kept saying to myself, and I was told every day, I'm never going to get out of here alive. I said, when I get out of here, when I get out of here, do not allow other people to get to you. You have a screen. I'm Hungarian gypsy, you know, do a little exorcism, you know. It doesn't belong to me. It doesn't belong to me. Now, I'm not asking you to embrace people and invite them to dinner. Um, just see the humanity in every one of us. There is a Hitler in every one of us. And so is love. And so is hope. Love is the answer and hope is the power in my book. So I would say that if you practice your low frustration tolerance level, I can't is not in my vocabulary. When I am in school, I put it on the board, I can't. And then I take the eraser and I take the apostrophe and the T, I can. Why? Because I think I can. Choo-choo train. The whole cognitive psychology is based on Epictetus, a um, Greek philosopher who said, and I quote, it's not the things that happen makes you feel the way you feel, but the way you view it. So the problem becomes a challenge. The midlife crisis becomes a wonderful transition. Well, sure, you know, I don't look like uh, the way I did. Uh, <laughs> um, but I am, I'm eating. We are very happy that you are eating. And, and self-love is self-care. A couple of questions I am going to ask you. One, when did your childhood end? And that was because many of us may have never been allowed to be children. We had to be little adult and go fetch daddy who was a drunk. And, you know, there is no Arya, Asi and Harriet and girl were babies. There is no perfect family. And we don't grieve over what happened. We grieve over what didn't happen. For instance, when my granddaughter, Lindsay, was born, the pediatrician examined her and said, this little girl is very flexible. She might become a ballerina. And I said, oh, my God, that's great. Now I can die. Now I have three generations. And Lindsay did become a ballerina. And she went to a very wonderful school in La Jolla, which is in the San Diego area where I live. And she asked me to buy her a dress to go to her dance. 
I'm the biggest sucker, I want you to know. I buy the best dress. I come home out of the blue, I'm crying. By the way, crying is good because what comes out of your body doesn't make you ill. What stays in there does. So, I'm crying. I don't understand why am I crying. And I came to the realization that I'm not crying because Lindsay went to a dance. I cried because I never went to a dance. And that's the work I do. I take your precious little hand and we go back and revisit that place where you've been. You had your Auschwitz, I had mine. So you see, suffering is feeling. And without feelings, we go through just, you know, the, just the stages, ages of life. But ask yourself, Piaget is, of course, uh, brilliant in that, talking about the ages and stages of development. I teach it at the medical school. So uh, see, see whether you are here at this conference, pregnant, and you're going to give birth to that you, that genuine you that you gave up, that you became the little princess in a family, or you became a daddy's little confidant, or God knows what. Where, what is the true you? I think this is a good moment. No, to not let yet. The question standing yet. here. Okay, I get signs, Eddie. We have the two more minutes, yeah? Okay. Well, I just want to say the second question. Oh, right, I'm sorry. Would you like to be married to you? <laughs> So go home and tell your husband, I'm ready to have an affair, and I want to have it with you. <laughs> yeah? You want to be loved? Be a lover. Yeah. Okay, I, I, there's so much to say. I want to tell you that I was taken out of Auschwitz in December um, 1944, and I became a slave laborer. I carried ammunition on a train. I ended up in Mauthausen. But... There was a time as the Russians came and the Americans came, we were evacuated, going from one place to another, and we were put in a German village on the, in a kind of a community hall, and we were told that if you leave the premises, you're going to be shot right away. My sister Magda said, if you don't get some food, I'm going to die. I didn't care. I went outside. I saw some carrots in the next garden. I am still, you know, a gymnast, and I jump, and I steal the carrots, and I come out, and I am with the guy with a gun. Never held a gun in my life, but I heard the clicking about three times. And I don't know if you had a German father, but he looked at me like a father who's going to teach me a lesson and turned the gun around and pushed me inside. I... Lost about six inches of my height. I have a pretty bad scoliosis. But there came not the following day and wanted to know who dared to break the rules. And I was so scared that I crawled to him. This is April 1945 and the German people are starving too. He gave me a little loaf of bread and said, you must have been hungry to do what you did. Wouldn't it be nice if I could meet this man today? You see? Wow. No, please don't generalize that all Germans are Nazis. I come to Germany and I look at everyone and I hug them and know that, uh, that Germany fessed up and, uh, and the larger Jewish population now in Europe is in Germany. So let's not, you know categorize and compartmentalize you know, they are beautiful people everywhere and I don't have time really to play cups and robbers I want to build rather than destroy it's easier it's easier to destroy a cathedral than build one so I think you started something here it's the healing process and see how every one of us carry with us something 
that you may hopefully at this conference ask yourself, what am I holding on to? And what am I willing to let go of? I love the word willing. I put four questions. One is, what do I want? And when I talk to people, what do I want? The man usually tells me, well, I want it to be a doctor. And then we talk and talk, and turns out he never wanted to be a doctor. He wanted to be a bartender. And that wasn't accepted in the family. So many people struggle between their own expectations versus trying to live up to someone else's expectations. And that's quite a hard work. What do you want? And are you willing to give up your need for approval and please everyone? So once you do that, I believe in a positive thinking, but I don't think it's good enough unless it's followed with a positive action. When I talk to teenagers, they tell me, I'm going to, yeah, it's a good idea. I'm going to, I call them going to people. They always going to, but they never are. You know, mañana, I'll think about it. See, they procrastinate. Yeah, mañana. What am I going to do about it? And uh, who cares when? So make a decision before you leave this conference and see how you're going to be a good parent to you because the only one you're going to have for a lifetime is you. All other relationships will end. Thank you. I think we could go on. Thank you so much.